Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and in this video we're going to be breaking down Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, which is widely regarded as one of the most influential movies of all time. Its styles went on to inspire so many different things in pop culture, and its legacy has loomed large over film, anime, and video games ever since its release. It's something that I've had a bit of a weird history with, and after feeling like it fell flat on my first watch, it's a movie that I've grown to love more and more the more that I've watched it. The futuristic film noir was something I saw as a teen, and I didn't really understand what was going on, so I found it a bit boring. This all changed though after I read the source material, watched multiple documentaries, and engrossed myself in this fantastic film world. There's just so much going on with it that they don't talk about in the film, and in this video I'm going to be explaining it all and also talking about that ending. There's so many hidden details and easter eggs layered throughout, and hopefully if you found the movie boring, this video changes the way you look at it. Based on the book to Android Stream of Electric Sheep, this Philip K. Dick adaptation might be one of his best known works because of how much of a cult following the film has. I think it's one of those movies that catapulted the author to the point where his name's up there alongside Stephen King and that he's someone who can go on the poster alongside the director and cast. Philip K. Dick is a name that sells the movie and everyone in Hollywood at some point has been after some dick. Sorry, everyone in Hollywood at some point has been after some Philip K. Dick. His work's been adapted into films like Total Recall, The Adjustment Bureau, Minority Report, and many, many more. Now, the name Blade Runner doesn't actually feature in the book, and this was something that was brought across from another science fiction novel that the creative team owned the rights to. According to the Now Playing podcast, uh, a Blade Runner referred to someone who smuggled medical supplies like scalpels in a dystopian future, but they liked the name because it just sounded cool. Which, to be fair, it does. Now replicants are also called Andes in the book, with Deckard being a bounty hunter instead of an officially sanctioned officer. The book gives a lot of the backstory that isn't really touched upon in the film, and it's important to bear in mind that this is a post World War 3 world in which a lot of the planet's been destabilised by an unnamed global catastrophe. Earth is now highly polluted and there's been major environmental fallout from this which is why LA looks like London. It's a far cry from what we know the city to be like today, and it's constantly raining there and only ever shown to us at night to cement this idea. Now in order to escape the fallout of the planet, humanity has ascended to the stars, and the UN's encouraging off-world emigration to several colonies that exist on other planets. In the book they try and lure people out there with an incentive involving getting a free android, and this will hopefully get the species to leave Earth. Each human is given one as a servant, if you use the discount code HEAVYSPOILERS at checkout you get a free one, and thus they can live affluent lifestyles amongst the stars. Now those left on Earth do so because a lot of them have either mental or physical defects. During the war, the toxin fumes that entered the atmosphere caused people to mutate, and this is why GF Sebastian is rapidly aging. There's also Gaff, played by Edward James Olmos, who has those iconic blue eyes, and several of the characters that we meet have something slightly off about them. Now there's this idea through our Blade Runner that the closer you are to the ground, the more impoverished you are. You don't even meet the people off world, and they're very much seen as being the elite. You have to get an elevator up to visit Tyrell, and the blimps belong to the corporations that now control the planet. Even though the movie has flying cars in it, you might notice that there's not actually that many, and this is also done for a specific reason. The ones we tend to see belong to the authority figures like the police and Blade Runners, showing how they exist above the majority of the population who have to inhabit the surface. You know the score, pal? You're not cop, you're little people. So also a beautiful shot of people riding on bikes, but in a futuristic world, this just denotes how much they're part of the lower class. Now owning animals is also seen as a symbol of wealth that exists throughout the movie. When the toxic pollution hit the air, this killed a lot of the wildlife, leading to almost all animals going extinct. Because the pollution spread throughout the atmosphere, it killed the birds off first, most notably the owls, which we see one of our Tyrells. Later on, Pris makes his comment. I'd be working in a place like this if I could afford a real snake. And there's this idea that animals have become replicants, just like how the humans have. Now, animals are given a lot more emphasis in the bark, with Deckard owning a replicant sheep that he keeps on his roof. Deckard is killing the Andes so that he can earn enough money to buy his wife a real animal, which he eventually does in the form of a Nubian goat. However, this is killed by Rachel, and the story actually ends with Deckard coming across a frog on a hillside, which he ends up taking home. He believes it's real, but they discover that it's a replicant, however in the end, they still decide to take care of it. 
And that's a very important theme that I think slays throughout the movie, and the film wrestles back and forth over whether replicants are real or not. In most science fiction stories, robots may look like humans on the surface, but once you get below the skin, you'll see their mechanical parts and also the machinery. That isn't really the case with Blade Runner, and the replicants appear to be humans both outside and in. They are 99.9% .9 perfect copies of us, and the only difference is that, if you used a microscope and zoomed in on their bones, you might see a serial number there or, or something to denote they were manufactured. Beyond that though, they are identical to us except for one thing. The machines don't have empathy. This is what the Voidcom test carries out, and it's believed that if you ask a replicant enough questions, that over time you'll realise they don't have emotions. Thus humanity's very much been able to separate them from us and classify them as less than human because they don't have a quote unquote soul. Eyes are said to be the windows to the soul, and throughout the film we get several ties to them. The Voidcom test takes a large focus on eyes, and in the scene with James Hong, we watch his character Hannibal making eyes for the replicants. Tyrell's eyes gleam out at us, and the character is killed by Roy pushing his thumbs directly into them. Well, the opening shot of the movie has several cuts of eyes in it as we travel through the sky, and it's clear this is important to pay attention to. I think the movie really asks the question over whether replicants actually have souls, and in all honesty, I find myself siding with them over Deckard and the other humans. It's important to bear in mind that all of the replicants are slaves, and that they've been manufactured to serve humanity rather than being a part of it. The word robot itself actually comes from the word robotnik, which in Russian means worker or labourer. It's basically seen as someone who does all the heavy lifting with very little else in their life. I think that the replicants definitely carry this idea. They were used to colonise other planets and explore the hazardous landscapes that they contain so that actual humans wouldn't be harmed when visiting them. They've all been given extremely short lifespans, and the movie centres around a group of them who've returned to Earth in order to extend theirs. They're painted out as desperate and sympathetic characters that clearly have emotions so that we feel bad when we see them die. Juxtaposing this, Deckard doesn't really come across as your typical hero, and in the movie, the two replicants that he takes out are women whom he shoots in the back. Zora's death is shot in slow motion, and the way she falls makes Deckard seem like he's just killed one of the hero characters rather than a villain. He chokes Rachel at one point, only lives at the end because Roy allows him to, and yet, He's not exactly a stereotypical good guy. Deckard is very much meant to be like a replicant himself in that he isn't supposed to have emotions, and in killing these replicants, he should remain detached. However, we see him drinking constantly throughout the film, and I've often seen this as being because it's something that eases up the guilt he carries over murdering sentient life. It adds extra layers to the film, and it was also pretty clear to me on this watch through that there were lots of themes about God and creation laced throughout it. Now that's a bit obvious, but there's a key change in the versions that adds something else to the final cut. Bit of a tangent here, but, but there were several versions of this film released, with a theatrical cut being what was put out originally, obviously. This was then followed by a director's cut, before the actual director's cut, the final cut, was put out in 2007. Reminds me of when you do 50 different edits and you just put final on the end of the last one, even though you know you're going to be doing about 15 more edits down the line. Anyway, the final cut has a slight change in it when Roy visits Tyrell. In the original version, he says, Death. Death. Well, I'm afraid that's a little out of my jurisdiction. You I want more life. Fucker. Whereas in the final cut, he says, you I want more life. Father. It's an extremely subtle change, but altering fucker to father is done for a very specific reason. Father is a name that we often use when referring to God, and this is Roy meeting his father. Now, Playing pointed out that the film is laced with this idea of killing our creators, and in humanity creating replicants, we've now killed God because we don't need him anymore. We also have the biblical imagery of Roy getting nailed through his hand, which seems to me to be a pretty on-the-nose crucifixion nod. Anyway, the father line is barely noticeable, but it adds so much more to the concepts in this movie. Now, there are some other changes in the film from the other versions, most notably the narration, which, yeah, if you've seen, you can tell Ford f***ing hated doing it. They don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. I didn't know whether Leon gave Holden a legit address, but it was the only lead I had, so I checked it out. 
itself phoned in and Ford originally had agreed with Scott that there'd be no narration in the movie. According to the documentaries, Ford spent months with Scott working things out so that everything would be in the movie without the need for voiceover. However, after the studio saw the film, they wanted some clarity added to it because of how unclear things were in the test screenings. Ford was called in to narrate and he said in interviews that he went in kicking and screaming because it didn't represent Ridley's vision and it was commissioned by people who had no interest in showing that. A separate writer was hired to pen these scenes who didn't know much about the film and Ford said that he went in to shake his hand in the recording studio but the guy just ignored him. What's wrong with you? It's Harrison Ford. So, so his plan was basically to record the lines as badly as possible because he thought there was no way they'd actually use them and I, I imagine his surprise when they showed up in the theatrical release. Four years, he figured. He was wrong. Tyrell had told me Rachel was special. No termination date. I didn't know how long we'd have together. Who does? It does sound terrible, to be honest, and when you hear it, you can instantly tell why the theatrical version is harder to find than an iPhone that still has Flappy Bird on it. Honestly though, after hearing it, I kinda want Harrison Ford to badly narrate my life. All I could do was sit there and watch him die. Now there are some other small changes in the theatrical and director's cut that was put together in a great video by Sticky T. It's 17 minutes long, but some of the changes include that Ford's face has been digitally removed in a scene with Tyrell. We can also see a thumb on Roy's shoulder in the phone booth, and this is because that was a flipped image from later on in the movie. Deckard's lip sync is corrected for the booth scene, and we also get a face replacement when Zora dies so that the stunt woman swapped out with a real actor. There's some minor differences to the unicorn dream scene, and Roy is later added to the window of the skyscraper to just create more intensity in that scene. Lastly, the backdrop of the dove shot is slightly different, and in the final cut they use a building that's more in line with the skyline of the city. Now as for the movie itself, we start off far in the future, in the year 2019. What? Anyway, we learn that the advanced Nexus 6 models start a mutiny on an off-world colony, and since then it's been made illegal for them to journey to Earth. Blade Runners have been tasked with quote-unquote retiring any models that journey to our planet, and the Voidcomp test is used to fish them out. We begin overlooking the LA skyline and this effect with the fire and lightning was done through using a miniature with flames superimposed over the top of this. Flame is of course chaotic and this juxtaposes the rigid and immovable structures that exist in LA. It's dark, bleak and completely devoid of nature, stripping away any true beauty from the world. This is almost a hellscape with flames very much giving us the idea that something terrible has happened in the world to change it to this industrialised landscape. As mentioned earlier, we get a close-up of an eye in the scene, and this is meant to symbolise an all-seeing eye looking over everything. There's lots of things open to interpretation here, but I've always took it as humanity now being like a god because they can create life and this is why it's put here. The city is reflected in the eye too, and this shows what humanity's created with its newfound power. We then see a giant pyramid with a man in the window looking over all, and as we learn this is someone setting up the Voidcom test for Leon. Pyramids carry their own subtext and they were owned by the pharaohs who ruled the lands of Egypt. Slaves were used to build them and all of the architecture that we see in the film was likely built off the back of replicants who were forced into labour. This man very much decides who lives or dies and in many ways he can be seen as a god passing judgement on the replicants. However, just like how humans rose up and defied god, our creations are doing that too and Leon murders the interviewer after being triggered by the questions. The questions here revolve around a tortoise being turned over on its back, which in the scenario Leon refuses to help. All of the Voidcom tests in the film feature some sort of animal, whether it's the tortoise here or the wasp later on, and animals are actually thought as being a way to teach children empathy from a young age. Deckard asks Rachel, You're watching television. Suddenly you realise there's a wasp crawling on your arm. I'd kill it. This is actually referenced later on in Blade Runner 2049 when a bee lands on Kay's hand but he doesn't kill it. The Voidcom test is also purposely set up to be similar to the Turing test. Originally called the imitation game, this is a test that measures whether a machine can pass as a human or not. It was heavily referenced in the film Ex Machina and its basis here is to see whether someone is a replicant or not. Leon is also asked about his mother. A mother? Yeah. Let me tell you about my mother. 
Later on, we hear a repeat of this scene. However, the tone is different. My mother? Yeah. I'll tell you about my mother. This shows that memory and emotions can be affected and that they may alter the way that we perceive things. There's also a subtle change in Leon's eyes and we see that they sort of gain the reflective gleam that the eyes of the replicants are shown to later have. This is a sign that the facade is slipping and that he's finally close to getting caught. Now from here we go to the skyline of Los Angeles and see a giant geisha on a billboard. The city that we see is highly influenced by Asian culture including neon dragon signs in the next shot, Japanese umbrellas and street vendors that are out selling noodles. I've seen lots of theories about what this signifies, with one even saying that this shows the world war was between Japan and America. According to the theory, the Japanese won, and this is why they're so heavily integrated into everything. Other theories have said it represents globalization, and that it plays into the idea of Asian superiority, which was a fear at the time amongst some circles. This was during a big boom in which many of our items were made in Japan and China, and this film was potentially depicting the eventual conclusion of this. A Deckard can be seen reading a newspaper, and this has the headline, Bombing the Oceans, the Moon, and Antarctica. These are all extremely hazardous locations to visit, and it shows how much we've stripped the planet of its natural resources. Below this we can see a smaller one that reads, Worldwide Computer Link Up Planned, and this actually predicted the internet, which wouldn't be made until 1989. In the sky we can see a large blimp, advertising the off-world colonies, and this is attempting to lure people out there so that we can leave Earth. Deckard grabs some noodles, which is when he's approached by a police officer and Gaff, who speaks in a foreign language. He's saying you under arrest, Mr. Deckard. Now, this was actually invented by Edward James Olmos, and the language itself is called City Speak. It's a mix of Japanese, Spanish, German, and English and it shows how much the world has come together as one, with us all bleeding into this melting pot. Now Gaff pretends that he can't speak English throughout the movie, however, we learn at the end that he in fact can. I guess you're through, huh? Finished. It's too bad she won't live! But then again, who does? However, well, there's a little clue that he, that he can, as when he starts up the police car, he understands the English instructions given to him. Now Deckard is taken in by him, and he passes a booth that says Vidphone, which shows people were well aware back then that we'd all be FaceTiming in the future. In the car, we also see a screen pop up with Purge on it, and this is Ridley Scott giving a little nod to his prior movie Alien, in which the same graphic was used. They travel to the police station, and I love how you can see other cars parked on the roof. I never really noticed this stuff until the 4K Blu-ray came out, and I definitely recommend that if you love the film, you pick that up, because there's so many extra things you notice in the movie just off the back of it. Now his old boss Bryant reveals why he's being called in, and during this moment, Gaff makes a little origami animal. Gav is someone who constantly taunts Deckard throughout the movie, and he even insults him when using the city speak. Now this is because he was the one who wanted the job of hunting down the replicants, and the fact that Deckard was picked over him rubs him the wrong way. However, in the end, he lets both Deckard and Rachel live, and shows them mercy due to the fact that he doesn't kill her. Instead, he leaves behind a calling card, which is an origami unicorn. Now as we see in the movie, Deckard has dreams about a unicorn, and this could indeed signify that he's in fact a replicant. As we learn in this beautiful narration from the theatrical cut. Four years, he figured. He was wrong. Yeah, the lifespan was changed in the case of Rachel, and there may be something similar within him. 2049 never clears it up, but let me know your thoughts below on whether you think he is one or not. Personally, I just prefer the idea that we have a Blade Runner falling in love with a thing he's supposed to hate, and it shows that replicants have souls if she's able to love him back. We'll talk more on it at the end of the video, but the origami could be seen as an indicator as to why he's indeed an android. Origami uses man-made materials to form something that's supposed to imitate an animal, and this is similar to how replicants use man-made materials to imitate living beings. Gaff doing this could be him further taunting Deckard, and he makes a chicken when he turns down the job. This obviously, well he thinks he's a chicken, and later on he leaves a man with an erection in Leon's apartment. This is after Deckard interviews Rachel, and it's meant to show that he's attracted to a replicant. Now, the unicorn comes at the end, which I promised to go more in depth on, but it shows these all have their own meaning that ties in with Deckard. 
You could say the one with the erection has its deck hard. For f sake, I'll just leave. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Now, Brian shows Deckard the footage of Leon's interview, and he talks about how six replicants came to Earth, but that two got fried trying to storm Tyrells. This is why they later use Sebastian, because it allows them to go on as a Trojan horse and pass all of his security measures. In the other versions, the dialogue is slightly different, and it says that only one got fried, which led many to think that Deckard was the missing fifth one. However, this was more of a budget issue, and there was supposed to be an extra person called Mary who was wounded after they stormed Tyrells. They did have scenes with her, but they just never got around to filming those bits, and the dialogue said that one died out of the six until they changed it to two. Now, Brian shows the data that they have on all the replicants, and this includes Pris, who we learn is a pleasure model. The four skin job is Pris, a basic pleasure model. Ironically, she was created on the 14th of February, which is of course Valentine's Day. Now, pleasure models are of course another word for sex slaves, and it shows that the replicants have been forced into every aspect of their life. We later learn that Roy is in love with her, and I've always kind of viewed this as being similar to Spartacus, where we have a slave falling in love with a servant and then rising up. When Pris dies, she spasms out on the ground, and this was meant to be almost like an orgasmic death, tying back to her purpose. Daryl Hannah is behind the pot, and Quentin Tarantino later references in Kill Bill when she arrives around on the floor. Now at this point, Deckard sent over to the Tyrell building in order to see if the test works on the Nexus 6 that they have there. It saw that these new models might be so advanced that the test is now out of date and that replicants will eventually hit a point where they can outmaneuver it. Brian touches upon this and says that the four year lifespan was built in as a failsafe in case they develop emotions and start to rise up and disobey their masters. At Tyrell's, Deckard meets Rachel and she asks him, May I ask you a personal question? Sure. Have you ever retired a human by mistake? To me, this is almost like a Voidcom test in itself because she's trying to see if she can stir emotions out of him. I think if you're killing people that are so similar to humans that it would indeed cross your mind, and with the test now almost being obsolete, it shows that mistakes can be made. Now the book has her doing something slightly different to the film, and Deckard stays with his wife in the end, even though he and Rachel sleep with each other. In a nice little twist in that, Rachel tells him that one of the fugitive replicants is the same model as her, and thus he'll have to kill someone that looks identical to the person he's fallen in love with. This is somewhat touched upon in 2049, when a version of Rachel is killed in front of him. Now in the book, Rachel admits that she was programmed to seduce bounty hunters like him so that she could turn them away from their missions. You could see that as being something that's in the movie too, and with her being an android, you might second guess whether she actually loves Deck or if she's merely dissuading him from his job. Now at this point we meet Tyrell, played by Joe Turkle. He's someone who's featured in our classic movie breakdowns before, and you might recognise him as playing Lloyd the Bartender in Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. There was actually going to be a major twist with Tyrell, and I kind of wish that they kept it in the movie. At the end when Roy killed him, he was going to realise that he was a replicant, and then he'd travel up into the pyramid and discover a tomb. This was where the real Tyrell's body was housed, and we learned that he'd been dead for 40 years. This unfortunately never made it to the film, but I think it would have added a great reveal to that final act that might explain more of Roy's madness. Tyrell then says, I want to see it work. Where's the subject? I want to see it work on a person. I want to see a negative before I provide you with a positive. What's that going to prove? Indulge me. He raises his hand almost similar how Jesus would when pardoning people, which I might be reading into, but it's just something I noticed. Anyway, Rachel shows how advanced that the new Nexus models are, and she takes the longest to fail a test out of any replicant that's came before her. I think it's also worth pointing out that Nexus means a connection, or series of connections linking two or more things. These are clearly the bridge between humanity and machine, and likely the next step in our evolution that will allow us to travel further into the stars. Once more, the questions are linked with animals, and she's asked about what she would do if she was given a cat skin purse, a jar full of butterflies, and the wasp that we talked about earlier. The film is shot with fade-ins and outs, showing how long it goes on for, with her failing the final question about being presented with a boiled dog. At this point, her, her pupil doesn't change or alter, showing that she has no emotional reaction to it, and thus she fails the test. Deckard then realises that Rachel doesn't know she's a replicant, and he says, Respect, how can it not know what it is? Again, this ties into the idea that Deckard could be a replicant too, and that he wouldn't know if he was. 
He doesn't really seem to have a personal life, and when we meet him, he's just sitting about with no real discussion of his backstory. It begs the question of whether you yourself would know if you were manufactured, if everything about you was identical to a human. If you were never told, then you could easily believe you were made naturally, which Deckard may be a victim of. Now we discover that Rachel was never told that she was a replicant, and they created an experiment in her to see if memories affected the machines. Rachel has had a real number done on her, and Tyrell's even given her photos of her as a child with a woman that she's been told's her mother. It's all used as a way to control her behaviour, and these experiences of the past enrich in her emotions, which is why she can last longer on the test than the other models. Deckard and Gaff then travel to Leon's apartment, and here the former finds a snake scale located in the bathtub. We see Leon watching outside, and then catch Deckard going through his belongings. In the drawer he finds a newspaper, and when he flips the cover over, we can see that this is the same one that Deckard had at the beginning. This could show that Deckard is indeed a replicant, as he potentially came to Earth at the same time that Leon did. Now Harrison Ford was someone who thought that Deckard should be human because it shows that people can change and accept the replicants. Deckard's a character that's spent years killing these machines, and it's got to the point that it's made him completely empty. Thus, the only thing that makes sense for his character is for him to fall in love with one, which is the journey he goes on throughout this entire movie. However, Ridley Scott has always said that it was his intention that Deckard was in fact a replicant, which is why clues like this exist throughout the film. Ford and Scott didn't get along on set, and both have admitted that they actually hated each other. However, they've said that they've all put that behind them now, but obviously the question still hangs over the movie as to whether Deckard's a replicant or not. Now we see in the next drawer that Leon has photographs, including some of children, which again is a similar thing to Rachel. He too is being given this false past, and this is so that he can pass the Voidkampf test. However, because Leon is aware that he's a replicant, he's not capable of lasting as long as Rachel is. Now at this point we see Roy, whose hand's slowly starting to seize up, which shows that he's dying. His first words are, Time. Enough. And this is of course something that he obsesses over in the film. Time. To die. Now we cut to Hannibal Chu's workroom, and we see him moving eyes out of a container with Chinese characters on it. Failed Mandarin at school, uh, but luckily the internet helped me solve it, and though the smaller characters are gibberish, the large one means eternity or long. Guessing this is saying that this is a long-lasting eye, which is similar to how we get long-lasting batteries. Now Chu can't help with longevity, as he just creates eyes, but he points them in the direction of JF Sebastian. We discover that Sebastian is rapidly aging, and thus he has some empathy for the replicants due to them both having shorter lifespans. At this point, Deckard returns home. He hits floor 97 in the elevator, and then when he goes to his apartment, we can see that the number is 9732, showing that this is the 32nd apartment on the floor. Rachel has gone out to his home, and even though she shows him a photo of her mother, he breaks the bad news to her. He does this by correctly telling her several of her memories, including a spider and its children that ended up eating her. These are similar to Deckard's dreams about the unicorn, and again, it ties in with his idea of animals constantly appearing throughout the movie. At this point, we see how cut up Rachel is about it, and realising that she actually has feelings, Deckard pretends it's a joke. It doesn't work though, however it shows Deckard starting to see them as people, rather than just being machines. She leaves and drops the photo, because she's now seen the truth, and has decided to not hold onto this past. Deckard picks it up, and you might notice there's a split second shot, where this photo actually moves, and we hear the voices of children. Now photos like this were used by the corporation in order to trigger memories, and staring at one would bring the implant back up. This is why it moves, and it doing this for Deckard could once more signify that he's indeed manufactured. The photo also has writing on the back, and it shows the extent that Tyrell's gone to ensure the illusion's kept up. We then see Pris walking through the streets, which is when she waited out for J.F. Sebastian. Pris then runs off, and she smashes her arm into Sebastian's car, which gives us this. Now Daryl Hannah actually slipped when doing this, and she ended up chipping her elbow in eight places. She carried on the scene though like a true professional, and being a pleasure model means she's adept at seducing Sebastian. At this point, we once more see a blimp overhead with a geisha on it. I think the movie is very much about accepting the other, and in many ways, America accepting Japan into their culture could be symbolic of how Deckard accepts Rachel. 
The movie is asking the question over whether it would be possible to do this, which the constant geishas could potentially symbolise. Now we then see Sebastian's home is filled to the brim with mannequins, and we learn that he lives in this giant building all by himself. This is likely because most people have moved off world, whereas he's had to remain because of his disease. Being lonely means that he has made toys to keep him company, and the replicants prey on the character's loneliness. From here we cut back to Deckard who slumped over his piano and this is the moment that he has the daydream about the unicorn. Interestingly, there are photos above it and these look somewhat similar to the ones that the replicants have. There's two people stood on the porch just like Rachel and her mother and also some that look like they're from the Victorian era. These could be showcasing that his memories are indeed plants and that these photos may potentially trigger the unicorn vision he has. Deckard then decides to scan one of Eon's photos and we get one of the movie's most famous scenes. Now this picture itself is somewhat of an easter egg and it's based on Jan van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait. Both have a circular mirror at the back of them that contains a hidden detail and Deckard discovers Zora when looking at it. He matches this up with a scale and then travels out in the city which is adorned with Japanese signs, swordfish being sold like a wet market and an eagle perched on someone's head. This is actually an area where replicant animals are sold, which is why we later see ostriches being moved through and ponies being sold off. Deckard goes to a snake seller who eventually leads him to a dealer and this is the person that points him in the direction of Zora. On the way we catch geishas dancing with hockey masks on, once more showing the mixing of the cultures. Deckard drinks the night away, drunk dials Rachel and finally Zora emerges as an exotic dancer with a snake. Now this actually belonged to the actress Joanna Cassidy and this is why she felt so comfortable with it in the scene. Realising that Deckard is a Blade Runner, she makes a Blade Runner for it, which leads to Deckard chasing her throughout the streets. Every person he bumps into has their own religion and culture, with this being a diverse street full of religions, lifestyles and all different walks of life. Oop, Atari symbol at the back, you might notice that. Now Deckard finally catches up with Zora, which leads to him shooting her in the back as she crashes through some glass. As Deckard walks in closer to her, we can see mannequins dressed in sexually provocative clothing and this deliberately looks identical to the clothes Zora is wearing right under her coat. These mannequins are all being held up in glass displays and Zora crashing through glass is supposed to be symbolic to how they are here. The glass boxes with the mannequins in house these sexual objects and are there to just be consumed. This is very much the case in Zora 2 and even though she's managed to break through the quote unquote glass box she was in, she was still killed. Now in the end her deaths film like a tragedy and Deckard is clearly shaken up by it. Bryant then arrives and tells her that Rachel's done a runner, a Blade Runner and, and that she's now been added to the list of targets. We see that the police number is also 995 which I think might show that 911's been changed but that might be a reach. Anyway, Deckard doesn't have to look far for Rachel as he catches her across the street. However, before he can go to her, he's grabbed by Leon who attempts to murder him. He does this by trying to push his eyes in and this is similar to how Roy kills Tyrell later on. We know that these underwent the same combat training and this is likely why they carry out the exact same killing method. Rachel saves him though by shooting Leon in the back of the head and from here we go to Deckard and catch him drinking a shot. Really nice bit of attention to detail here and I love how the glass fills with blood as he sips away showing he's still bleeding from the fight with Leon. Now at this point he sees more humanity in Rachel due to her shaking after just killing Leon. Deckard says that he gets his too and it shows that there's this side within him that knows he's not just killing machines. Rachel asks if Deckard ever took the test himself and again this is meant to make us question whether he's human or not. Rachel goes through the photos on his piano and in the theatrical cut, the narration tells us that replicants are obsessed with them. They have such short lifespans and they take photos because it's a way to hold onto their memories and show that they were real. Roy at the end says, All those moments will be lost in time. Like tears. And he's very much showing that they need to take photos to record what really happened. Rachel changes her hair after this and she opens it up in order to mimic the photos slightly. This could be part of her programming to seduce Deckard and at this point he's of course supposed to be hunting her. She plays the piano perfectly and recalls her memories of her lessons which are of course fake. Now the pair get it on after this and we then cut to Pris spray painting her eyes black. She does this because she wants to look like one of Sebastian's toys is now a fake person designed to be a real thing 
as having to try and look fake so that she can blend in with the other creations. She then goes over to Sebastian and you might notice that in the top right of the screen that there is a unicorn. This is the only time that one appears in the movie outside of the dream in Origami and it could be suggesting that because Deckard sees this that Sebastian had a hand in his creation. Roy arrives and he says, I like a man that stays put. And this is because Sebastian was someone who wanted to move off world but he failed a medical and this is why he has to remain behind. We then see Sebastian's chessboard and learn that he has an ongoing match against Tyrell. The board is filled with animals and there's also a giant ostrich calling back to the ones at the bazaar before. Now Sebastian wants them to show off their abilities but they protest and say that they're more than just computers. Pris says I think therefore I am and this is a phrase that was first coined by the philosopher Descartes. He pondered whether his existence was real one day and wondered whether he'd be able to tell if this world was a dream or not. If it wasn't then this meant that nothing he believed truly existed and thus he questioned whether he really existed too. However, he realised that because he's at least thinking that he does indeed exist, even if he's out there in another reality, imagining the world he now finds himself in. Now they convince Sebastian to take them to Tyrell, and Roy picks up two eyes again, calling back to this iconography that appears throughout the movie. Now they go to Tyrell's, which is when Roy instructs Sebastian on how to beat him at chess. This shows that the Nexus models have surpassed their makers and are now capable of beating humans at everything. They run through multiple scenarios in order to try and see if there's a way to extend the life of the Nexus, but all attempts in the past have proven to be fatal. It's very much about how we can't escape our fate and that in the end we all must die. Roy is referred to as the prodigal son and this again ties back to the Bible and religion. Roy kisses Tyrell before killing him and Sebastian is filmed standing behind canals which resemble bars holding him back. After his car's almost robbed, Deckard goes into Sebastian's building which is where he faces off against Pris who becomes almost doll-like. Again, mannequins surround this location along with the toys that she's seen as being equal to. She almost kills Deckard between her thighs, again tying back to the idea of her being a pleasure bot. Now Deckard then kills her and this leads to the final showdown with Roy. Very over the top and Roy toys with him and breaks his fingers after pulling his hand through the wall. Deckard takes a shot at Roy who makes it seem like he's missed, however we see in the next moment that his ear is in fact bleeding. Roy mourns Zora as he gives Deckard a countdown to escape and he taunts him through the scene by singing opera and showing that he clearly outmatches him. Roy is very much just spiralling into insanity and he knows that even if he wins he still loses because time is running short. This very much flips the script and we see the hunter become the hunted as Roy chases after him. It's brilliant watching him howl at the moon and run through the shadows and it leads to one of the most memorable scenes in cinematic history. Now Roy and Deckard are meant to be extremely similar at this point with them both being badly wounded. The pair's hands are both seized up as well and it's meant to show Deckard that they are both very similar. On the roof, Deckard makes a leap to another building and though Roy could let him die at this point, he decides he has to save him. Though Deckard has killed the woman he loves and all of his friends, Roy still pulls him in and it's supposed to carry the message of forgiveness. The replicants are better than we are and he of course has a nail in his hand evoking images of Christ and just like him, he turns the other cheek in order to become a saviour. His final act of life is to show pity and this makes you question whether the corporations hunting him were truly just in what they wanted. Now Roy discusses his life and he says, Seeing things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. It's something that really sticks with you and it shows just how precious life is. Rutger Howe actually wrote this monologue himself and the things mentioned in it have been used widely in science fiction. For example, the Tannhauser Gate has popped up in a number of different things and it potentially pulls from Richard Wagner's adaptation of the Knight Tannhauser. This was a character that fell from grace in the eyes of God, potentially like how Roy did with his own creator. Either way, he dies holding a dove which he then releases into the air as he passes away. Symbolically, doves are meant to represent the human soul and him doing this potentially shows that he did indeed have one. Deckard witnesses this completely blown away because he's just seen that the replicants are indeed alive. Now, an important thing to bear in mind about this movie is how language is used to make it so that people seem less than human. 
For example, they say that replicants are retired instead of killed because to kill something means that it was alive. You don't say you killed your computer when you turn it off, and this is a similar thing when it comes to them. Roy saying that it's time to die also means that he was alive too, making this a very important line. Gaff then drops a line about Rachel, and Deckard returns home to find her under a blanket. Initially, we all led to believe that she's dead, but Gaff's allowed her to live, and this means that she and Deckard can have a life together. They don't know how long that will be, but they go on the run, and Deckard once more becomes the hunted as they go out to some banging synth music. Now, I showed you the versions before with the narration, but that's pretty much what was originally intended for the film. There was a lot of shots of the hills and countryside used for this, and they actually compiled a lot of the B-roll from The Shining for these moments. Kubrick filmed a ton of things for the intro, and as Warner Brothers owned both, they just decided to save Scott some money and use it there. Now we also know that they did have a life together because of 2049 and that the pair also managed to go and create a daughter. That's a breakdown for another time, but we do have the unicorn being left at Deckard's that we have to discuss. Now the most obvious signifier here is that Gaff's used origami to taunt Deckard throughout and this signifies that he's a replicant. It ties into his dream of the unicorn and it's very much Ridley Scott's vision of the ending, which has been left in the final cut because that's what he intended. There was also a deleted scene with Gaff in which he says, are you really human? It's hard to tell around here. And the fact he's overlooking Deckard's operations could show that they don't fully trust a replicant running around. However, he did cut this scene and this could be to make this ending more ambiguous. Scott has said that people can take their own meaning from it and that he's not there to say what's right and what's wrong. Harrison Ford also, of course, worked alongside him to make this movie, and as we mentioned several times before, he thinks Deckard is human. I go with that more, because it means that this movie is about a person who's been tasked with retiring these machines, who in the end realises that there's more to them than meets the eye. There's not really that assessment there if he's also a replicant himself, so that's what I tend to side with when I'm watching the film. Now, the other way to take it is that Gaff knows Deckard has Rachel, and that he views her as being a unicorn. To get a unicorn, of course, means to get something unique, and Rachel herself is one because she has an extended lifespan and takes longer to fail the test than any other replicant. This could mean that Deckard has found a unicorn, and Geff's allowing him to keep her as a sign of respect for completing the job. Deckard seemingly nods when he sees it, and whatever meaning it has, he understands why it's there and somewhat accepts it. In the end, I think there's probably enough things in the film that you can really support any conclusion if you look at it close enough, and that's also what I believe is the beauty of Blade Runner. One of the greatest films ever made, depending on what version you watch, the movie has influenced so much, and I hope you enjoyed going back through it with us. It's been great seeing the response you guys have given over going back through these older films, and if you want to see breakdowns like this early, then you can become a member of the channel for as little as 99 cents a month. That will get you these uh, and other videos early in advance, and that makes a massive difference to the running of the channel. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you want something else to watch, then we have a breakdown of Ridley Scott's other sci-fi masterpiece, Alien, linked on screen right now. We've also covered Aliens as well, so definitely head over there to one of them right after this. By the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, and I'll see you next time. That will be Blade Runner 2049, so make sure you stay locked and have an awesome week. Take care. Peace.